God bless you. Pastor Daryl Scott here, Senior Pastor, New Spirit Revival Center Church in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. It's Thursday evening. We're going into the Word of God once again. On tonight, I want to present um, a message to you that I've entitled. It's going to be a series of messages or a mini series that I've entitled The Pathway to Purpose. The word purpose actually implies intent. Purpose, intent. Uh, they are synonymous one with another. Purpose implies looking towards the future to a desired goal or destination. And what we're going to bring out tonight is the fact that the pathway of purpose, the path, pathway to purpose, is very often uncomfortable. It is difficult. It is challenging. Uh, there's a lot of hindrances. There are a lot of obstacles in your way on your pathway to your purpose. Amen. That's why, though, if you stay true to it, true to the word of God, true to the will of God, true to the steps that God has ordered for you to take, even though oftentimes we find ourselves in ordered steps by God, not knowing that God is the one that ordered those steps. You know, I always say this, and I hope you hear me in the spirit that I'm saying it. I oftentimes recognize God and the activity of God more so in hindsight than I do in midsight or in foresight. I can look back on circumstances and look back on situations and see, you know what? That was God right there. That was God in that difficult time. That was God that caused me to go in that direction rather than this direction. But you know, oftentimes when you're in a challenging situation, you're not sitting in that challenging situation telling yourself, oh, this is God right here. Now, I'm using Joseph as an example in tonight's installment. And Joseph, even when he came out of his difficult uh, circumstances and he was able to, amen, um, speak to his brothers that were the, the mechanism or the, 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 the dynamic that caused him or the vehicle that caused him to be in the shape that he was in, he was saying, I'm not mad at y'all because now I can look back and see that it was God that sent me here. For the purpose, a purpose, God sent me here to preserve life, to preserve the nation of Israel. He sent me here for the sake of preservation. I didn't realize it then. And when you think about Joseph's life, all that time he was in those challenging situations, when he was in that pit, when he went into the slavery, when he was in uh, servitude in, in Potiphar's house, when he found himself in jail in the dungeon, I, I, let me tell you something. He wasn't sitting in those situations saying, this is God. I'm in the will of God. Oh, look where God has got me at. Oftentimes we judge the will of God and the steps that God orders us in through our comfort level. But I, I want to let you know that oftentimes God will lead you through more discomfort than he does comfort on your way to your place of purpose that he has outlined or he has in mind for you. All right. So uh, if you have an ear to hear and a heart to receive, I believe you will be blessed on tonight. Put on your spiritual thinking caps. Amen. Let's go into this word of God, see what God has for us. And I promise if you allow it to, it will bless you. All right. I'll be back afterwards. Verse 22. And God remembered Rachel and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph and said, the Lord shall add to me another son. Chapter 37. We went over this chapter in the first service. And Jacob dwelled in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it to his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. Verse 18. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, this dreamer cometh. Come now, therefore, and let us slay him and cast him into some pit. And we will say some evil beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. Verse 23, And it came to pass when Joseph was come unto his brethren, that they stripped Joseph out of his coat, his coat of many colors that was on him, and they took him, cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. 
there was no water. And then they, they sat down to eat bread and they lifted up their eyes and looked and behold, a company of Ishmaelites came from Gilead with their camels bearing spice, we and balm and myrrh, going to carry it down to Egypt. Uh, let's go to uh, 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 verse 26. And Judah said to his brethren, what profit is it if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh and his brethren were content. Chapter 41. Verse 38, And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto my word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. Verse 50, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of Mon, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, He has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. In the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And the seven years of plenty in this that was in the land of Egypt were ended. Chapter 42, final readings. Verse 6, And Joseph was governor over the land, and he was the soul to all the people of the land. And Joseph's brethren came and bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. Verse 9, And Joseph remembered the dreams which he dreamed of them. Father, bless us this morning, and we thank you in advance for the blessings. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I feel luncheon this morning to target this particular message to those who feel as if you really can't continue much longer if you remain in the current situation that you are presently in, or if this circumstance or situations proceed the way that they have been going or proceed the way they are. Because if the truth be told, amen, and this is something we don't oftentimes think about, but some of you had to overcome a great deal of opposition opposition just to be able to make it here just to be able to come out on this morning some of you experienced emotional opposition you just 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 got up feeling some kind of way and some of you were opposed psychologically while others of you went through some emotional or some relational drama just to be able to attend service on this morning don't shout me down Others of you just got up and really didn't have any opposition at all, except having to decide what to wear. <laughs> Your battle was matching colors. Uh, what shoes should I wear, the Jimmy Choo's or the Prada's? Which bag should I carry? Your biggest battle that caused you to go, and you got attacked by the pantyhose demon just when you was about to <laughs> hit a zoop. What the, what? the devil is a liar. Your last pair. Now you done got out the fingernail polish. <laughs> got that fingernail polish out. And stop that sucker dead in his tracks. And so it, it don't go any, proceed any further. Some of us this morning really had or have no overt external opposition that we had to fight with the wrestle with just to be able to make it to church this morning, just to be able to lift up holy hands and give God praise. And that's all right. Because no apparent opposition is oftentimes our greatest opposition. No obvious fight is oftentimes our greatest fight because the lack of opposition can be detrimental to us because it can cause us to become apathetic or lethargic in our pursuit of the purpose of God for our lives. We'll get complacent and content and satisfied on the level that we're on because things are going smoothly. Come on, say amen to me. And because things are going smoothly and you don't feel challenged, there's no reason to try to excel past where you are. A lack of opposition can lead to a lack of desperation. 
uh, come on, talk back to me. And that's all right. And sometimes in order to access the blessings of God or realize the purpose of God in and for your life, you've got to be a little bit desperate. Amen. You've got to engage in desperation because desperation creates a hunger that cannot be satisfied with anything less than complete fulfillment or complete satisfaction. Can I take my time? And I told y'all I'm tired. I'm, I'm trying to catch my sleep back. So I'm actually like, nah, not while I preach. Reminds me of what Muhammad Ali said when he fought uh, George Foreman. He said, I was actually knocked out a couple times on those ropes. He said, but I woke back up again. <laughs> he, said, he said, he knocked me out a couple times. But it was like some three or four second knockouts. I was with the, I was in D.C. at a round table with the president the other day and they was talking. And I sat there and did one of these. <laughs> I hurt my neck jumping up. <laughs> my dad, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> Say amen. But it creates a hunger. Desperation does. In, in the 22nd chapter of the book of Numbers, the, God presented, uh, or he prevented the backslidden prophet Balaam from pronouncing a curse upon the nation of Israel. Amen. Although he had attempted to do so several times, God telling Balaam in the 12th verse of the 22nd chapter, he said, you shall not curse this people for they are blessed. In biblical sim, uh, typology, Balaam symbolized the enemy, the devil, amen, one who was once in the favor of God that was now out of the favor of God, who was coming against the people of God. And even as God prevented Balaam from cursing Israel then, he prevents the devil from cursing his people now. And even though it may appear that you are in a cursed situation or a bad situation, you have to recognize the fact that appearances are not always relevant. Appearances are not always reliable, amen, because things are not always the way that they appear to be. What's happening is not necessarily what's going on. What's happening was Joseph was in the prison. What's going on was he was on his way to a palace. What's happening was Jesus was on the, on, the, uh, uh, on the cross. But what was going on was he was on his way to glory. The Bible says the things that are seen, the things which appear are temporal, which means they are subject to change at any moment. And that then underscores, saints of God, the reality that oftentimes what appears to be a negative or a cursed situation is in actuality an avenue that God is going to use to extract more glory from your life and to use it as a channel to bless you like you've never been blessed before. Because how many know, of you know God can take your calamity or take your struggle or take your issues or perceived opposition and hindrances and turn those things so completely around that what you thought was detrimental was in actuality complemental to your life. Amen. And, and was an avenue that you had to traverse in order to arrive at your place of purpose. I'm going to get you there, I promise. How many of you know good times and happy times and prosperous times? They are indeed wonderful. Amen. But how many of you also know that you enjoy good times better when you've been through bad times? Come on, talk back to me. Uh, you appreciate blessed times better when you've been through cursed times. You enjoy prosperity more when you've experienced poverty. And happiness is enjoyed better after a period of sadness. It reminds me of uh, the, the, the hotel magnet. I think it was Conrad Hilton and he and his partner. And when Conrad Hilton, Conrad Hilton was getting towards his death, his partner came to visit him. And he said, Conrad, remember back when we were first starting out and we used to have to jump on the back of trains to get around and we had to, had to him and we were, we were hoboing for a while and we were this, that. Remember those good times? I miss those good times. Conrad looked back and said, yeah, I remember those times, <laughs> but I like these times better. Come on, say amen to me, somebody. Look at that person and say, I remember the bad times, but I like the good times better. I remember the broke times, but I like the prosperous times better. Because you appreciate it better when you've been through. But it's a sad, the true fact that God can teach us more through bad times than God is able to teach us through good times. It seems as if we learn more from our defeats and we learn more from our challenges and our trials and failures than we learn from our successes and our victories. Amen. Uh, we can fail at something one time and say, I ain't doing that no more. We can learn immediate lessons. We don't learn financial management in times of prosperity and abundance and increase. 
We learn financial management in times of decrease and lack when we have to stretch and maneuver and navigate and exercise self-denial in order to make ends meet when we don't have but $20 left till next Friday. You learn financial management when the wolves are at the door, all the children are empty, you're mixing bread with the ground beef, beef Kool-Aid is the drink that you have. You're trying to stretch that meat, you're putting eggs and bread in with the ground beef, trying to stretch it out so you have enough for everybody else, and you pay just enough to keep the utilities on, and, and, and come on, say amen to me. You, 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 you ascertain your, your mileage on your car by how far you can go on E. Be like, you on E? Oh, no, I can he'll make it over to 31st and Kinsman on E. I can. Oh, that ain't nothing. I'm here. You're so used to that. You don't measure the needle going right. You measure the needle going left. Oh, man, the red emergency light ain't on yet. I'll be all right. Then once the red emergency light comes on, I still got about 15 miles to go. Come on, talk back to me. That's when you learn. That's when you learn financial management. Sometimes it takes adversity in our lives to build character and to develop wisdom and to prove ourselves in the eyes of the Lord. Talk to me, somebody. Because in the natural, see, here's the, here's the conundrum right here. In the natural, amen, there's the lesson first. My grandson had to take his ACT test, but they had time to study the lessons and prepare and even get tutors for the test. In the natural, there's the lesson first. In and then there's the test. You study the lesson, you learn the lesson, then you take the test. And the test is on the lesson that you learned. But in God, help me, Holy Ghost, uh, the test always comes first. And then after the test, the lesson is learned. The financial test comes first. Then the lesson is learned. The relational test comes first. Then the lesson is learned. Can I keep on? God knows that if you give him a dime out of every dollar, even during times of financial adversity, he knows that if you give him $10 out of 100 in times of financial adversity, that you will give him 100 out of every 1,000 that he blesses you with when he turns your financial situation around. Because God is aware of the fact that prosperity will not hinder your Christian walk. That you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and wait for him to come on, say amen to me add the things that you need to you. That's why David said, in my prosperity, I will not be moved. He was saying, Lord, when I become prosperous. Now, he said this when he was on the run. He said this when he was hiding in caves. He said this in a state of deprivation, but he looked forward in faith and knew God was going to bless him. He said, Lord, when I become prosperous, I won't be moved. I'm in a bad way right now, but God, I'm believing you to bless me. And when you do bless me, I, I won't drip from God. I won't stray from God, I, I'll still have the same fervor. I'll still have the same excitement. I'll still have the same zeal for God that I had before I became prosperous. And God also knows in his omniscience that if you can praise him in tough times, if you can praise him when you've been backstabbed and betrayed and forsaken, if you can praise him when you're all alone and depressed and lonely and misunderstood, he knows that when he turns your situation around, you will praise him even all the more. David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. And how many of you know everybody talks about, I want the anointing of David. I want the anointing of David. Everybody wants the anointing of David. You want the anointing to slay giants. You want the anointing to write psalms and sing psalms. But you don't request the anointing of endurance. You don't want the anointing to dump when a spear is coming your way. You don't want the anointing to hide when you know the enemy is on your tracks. You, want the, you don't want the ability to praise God in times of adversity and challenge and oppression and repression, suppression. Because as much as we love good times, good times do not build faith. Faith is learned in lion's dens. Faith is learned in fiery furnaces. Faith is learned in a knock down, no holes barred fight, a fight with the devil. And it causes you, to, your faith causes you to hold on to God 
in spite of your circumstance and in spite of the situation and say like Job said, though he slay me yet when I trust him all the days of my appointed time, all the days of this test of trial, I'm going to wait on God until my change comes. Uh, some of y'all been waiting on God uh, and it seems like you've been waiting for a mighty long time. Uh, if I'm talking to you, uh, talk back to me, uh, but you can rest assured in your faith uh, that God is not a forgetful God. Uh, the Bible says he never slumbers or sleeps. Uh, and when your appointed time comes, uh, when the time of your test is over, your change is going to come. Uh, but until it does, uh, just wait on the Lord. Uh, wait on the Lord. Uh, because they that wait on the Lord uh, shall renew their strength. Uh, look at that person next to you and tell them, uh, say, God hasn't forgotten you. Uh, he's aware of your circumstance uh, and your problem uh, and your struggle. Uh, and he's watching over you. Uh, and when you discipline yourself uh, to sense his presence uh, and fellowship with him, uh, despite your situation, uh, God will take your situation, uh, turn it around, uh, and bring you out uh, with a strong and mighty hand. Uh, somebody shout hallelujah. In, in considering the life of Joseph, in the text that we read, we see his situation was a challenging situation if there ever was one. Hated by his family. When I get to yours, just shout amen. amen. <laughs> Hated by his family. Betrayed by his brother prison. He's alone. He's afraid. He's persecuted. He's perplexed and written off. If anybody's life seemed challenging or any situation has seemed uh, that seemed negative. If anybody had a cause to be bitter, it was him. But through it all, he trusted God and held on to God and relied on God. And when this appointed time came and when the time for his change came, God took him out of his dungeon and placed him on a throne. And some of you are in a dungeon right now. The dungeon was the lowest part of the prison, amen. But God is using this time to prepare your throne. Somebody say, I received that. And just like Joseph's gift made room for him, God is going to allow your gifts to make room for you. Look at that person next to you, touch him and tell him and help me preach because I'm tired. Say, so you might be down right now, but as long as you've got God, you're never out. As long as you've got God, come on, look at him and tell him, say, as long as you've got God, you've still got a chance. As long as you've got God, you can win your battle. As long as you've got God, you can get your breakthrough. As long as you've got God, amen, no weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. Think about this. Now, in examining and scrutinizing, investigating the life of Joseph, you see that his life was, was challenged. Amen. From the, the devil contested his, his, his birth from the very beginning. His mother was barren. We read it in the 30th chapter, the first verse. Rachel was barren. And she helplessly watched her sister bear child after child. She's coming, I'm pregnant. Okay. I'm pregnant again. Okay. Who? I'm pregnant again. All right. I'm pregnant again. This one right here. <laughs> the sister that wasn't supposed to even be in the marriage in the first place. The one who got the position through trickery and deception, yet she appeared to be the blessed one while Rachel, who was God's choice, was infertile because the Bible says that the devil had shut up her womb. She's in a state of non-productivity alone and seemingly forgotten by God. See, some of you this morning, you either are or have been in a situation where it seems as if the people around you are producing while your life is barren. Because the enemy will attempt to close you up and stifle you to hinder or suppress your productivity because he knows that there is a promise and a purpose and a potential inside of you that is greater than all of the conceptions of somebody else. 
And so he wants to close you up and stop you from producing because he doesn't want what you possess on the inside. He doesn't want the potential you carry on the inside to manifest on the outside. He doesn't want what you can conceive to be birthed. Say amen. And so when we ponder upon the dynamics of Rachel and Leah, we see rivalry and conflict that extends throughout their lives from the moment Jacob enters into his father's house. Here they are, these two sisters. Now, he, he's supposed to marry the one. He loves Rachel, and he's supposed to marry her. And that night, I guess it was dark in the tent. <laughs> sleeps with The father pulls her back, slides the sister in there, and he sleeps with her. And didn't stop till he woke up and looked. Say amen. amen. So they vie for Jacob's affection as they endeavor to strengthen their personal positions by providing him with progeny for the future. They're trying to guarantee their position by giving him children. And in spite of all of their differences, Rachel and Leah are actually very similar in that each one constantly measures herself by the other one's relationship with Jacob. And that's a trap a whole lot of women find themselves falling into, measuring themselves by the way a man or their man interacts with other females. They don't want to help me right now. He opening doors for the sisters of church and letting the door slam in your face. He missed a nice guy over here. He, you go to his job and you don't recognize this Negro. He's just so nice and so charming and so, so gentlemanly at work, but he come home and act like a pig. Come on, somebody talk back to me. They're measuring, Rachel is getting her self-esteem by the way Jacob interacts with Leah. Leah's getting her self-esteem by the way Jake, and Jacob interacts with Rachel. They gain self-esteem from his attention, and they lose self-esteem over his lack of attention. Can y'all help me? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Let me tell you something. Who we are should be a reflection of our own individual talents, abilities, or limitations. We should not. We should never define ourselves in relation to somebody else. So here's Rachel, she's barren. Rachel is non-productive. And she's experienced the birth of her sister's four sons. And she realizes she hasn't provided Jacob with any children. She becomes envious of her sister to the point that she tells Jacob, give me some kids or else I'm gonna die. In spite of her beauty, in spite of her husband's love, in spite of her own individual attributes, whatever gifts, talents, or abilities that she had, all she can see is that her sister is fertile, her sister is productive, and has presented her husband with four sons, and as a result, she feels that her entire relationship with Jacob is in jeopardy. Here she is, insecure, jealous, self-deprecating, and only through bearing children can she feel whole and fulfilled because she can only see herself in light of who her sister is and how her husband feels about her. She's caught up in a battle for her husband's affection with her sister. Some theorize, some theologians have stated her sister was possibly her older twin because her self-esteem was determined not by the way she felt about herself. Her self-esteem was determined by the way somebody else felt about her. But look at somebody and say the devil is a liar. Don't you ever allow anybody other than you to determine the way you feel feel about yourself. The Bible says you're fearfully and wonderfully made, created in his image and after his likeness. Don't you ever give anybody that much power over you that they determine the way that you feel about yourself. Negro, you want to leave? Bye. Let the doorknob hit you and a good Lord split you. I'm going to be all right. You don't want to be a part of me. You don't want to have anything to do with me. I really don't care because I know that I know that I know. I'm gonna have anybody else dictate and determine how I feel about me? Look at somebody say the devil is more than a liar. But it says that God remembered Rachel. 
He remembered her. You might think you're forgotten by God, but touch somebody and say, God has not forgotten you. Uh, God told Moses, he said, tell Israel, I've seen your tears. I've heard your cries. I know your sorrow, and I'm coming to deliver you. And God told me to tell somebody this morning, he's seen your tears when you're all by yourself. He's heard the cry that's come out of your heart. He knows what you're going to, and he is going to deliver you. Shout. He says, God remembered her. He remembered his promise. He remembered his purpose. And he remembered the potential that she had inside of her. And the Bible says he hearkened unto her, which means that while she was going through her barren season, once again, he hearkened unto her while she was going through her non-productive season, while she was enduring the most fruitless time of her life she kept on praying <laughs> oh help me Holy Ghost she kept on petitioning God despite her loneliness despite her barren state despite her frustration despite her anguish despite her tears she held on to her faith in God she kept on praying she kept on believing she kept on praising she kept on worshiping and as a result God intervened opened up her womb a conception occurred and a manifestation came forth and God said for me to tell somebody he's remembering you right now hearkening to your prayers and he's about to open some things up that have been closed he's gonna open doors no man can close he's gonna open up some opportunities that's been denied God said the devil's been trying to keep you locked down but he's about to release you into the fullness of your potential and turn your barrenness into a blessing shout about it when her manifestation came, she named him Joseph. First of all, she's glad that she's pregnant. Second of all, she's glad it was a boy. She named him Joseph, which means he will increase. She was prophesying to her situation right there. She said, my blessing is going to increase. Look at somebody and say, I know that's right. Then she said, if you read it, she said, God has taken away my reproach. He's taken away the source of my shame. He's taken away my disgrace. He's taken away my embarrassment. And then he said, she said, he shall add to me another son. She was prophesying to herself. She was saying, I got this blessing, but this ain't all. This ain't all. My blessing is not going to stop now. God is going to keep on blessing me. God is going to continue to bless me. Look at somebody and say, God is going to continue to bless me. Because sometimes, saints of God, you've got to prophesy to yourself. Because can't nobody else, I don't care how anointed they are, can't nobody else speak to your situation like you can. You've got to tell yourself, God is going to bless me. God is going to increase me. God is going to prosper me. God is going to deliver me. He is going to bring me out. He is going to make a way. He is going to turn it around. This is just a test of going through. The last page hasn't been written. This last scene hasn't been shown. It's going to turn out fine. I am going to make it. I will get the money. I am going to get healed. God will send me somebody. Shout hallelujah. Rachel had finally been blessed by God. But she didn't stop right there. She said, this ain't all. <laughs> Not after all I've been through. <laughs> I didn't go through that one through just to get one. <laughs> I've still got some more blessings coming. God has not finished blessing me yet. I've been waiting for too long. I've cried too many tears. I've taken too much abuse. I've been lonely for too long. I've been depressed for too long. I've been frustrated for too long. I've been in pain for too long. So as good as this blessing is, baby, I still got some more that I'm believing for. Look at somebody and say, God is going to give you so much more than you've been believing for. Shout about it. I'm trying to get there. I got a few more minutes. So here's Joseph. He's oppressed before. He's opposed before he's even born. 
Devil's trying to keep him from coming out, made his mama barren. Devil didn't want him to be born. And then he didn't have a pleasant childhood. I mean, we first read about him. Genesis 30, his mother is, is, is barren, and she finds him. In Genesis 33, he's with his mother and father. And they're fleeing from his uncle Esau, who's coming with 400 men to kill his father because he deceived him out of his birthright with the help of Joseph's grandmother. Then in Genesis 34, Joseph's brothers become murderers, mass murderers, because of the rape of his sister Dinah, while his mother dies giving birth to his baby brother. So look at his life. His uncle wants to kill his daddy because he stole his inheritance. It was all set up by his grandmother. His sister gets raped. His brothers murder somebody. And his mother dies having his baby brother. This is not a pleasant childhood. You talk about family drama. You talk about family issues. Come on, say amen to me. He by no means had a perfect childhood. And now his preferred position in his family and his isolation and alienation from his brothers is evident from the outset of his, his, his family in Canaan. It says, Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And then it says, watch this, in, in, in Genesis 37, 1, it says, Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. Then it says, these are the generations of Jacob. And you would have expected that when he says, these are the generations of Jacob, that he would have traced his lineage, like Jacob was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, who, who was the son of him, who was the son of him. And you thought the lineage was going to be traced. But it says, these are, you know, in chronological order. And then it says, these are the generations of Jacob. Then it says, Joseph. It didn't say Reuben or Simeon or Levi or Gad or Asher, Naphtali, Zebulon, Zebulon Issachar, Dan. It didn't say any of those guys. These are the generations of Jacob. You think he's going to list all the sons in chronological order. Then it says Joseph. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph. It means the future of the family is now focused on Joseph. Joseph alienates his brothers. He displays leadership qualities while they're out acting a fool, and even at a young age. Uh, then his oldest brother, Reuben, disrespects his father, Jacob. You're talking about some family drama. <laughs> Bet not nobody never say nothing about me <laughs> after all this. Look at somebody and say, me neither. Y'all notice how bad my grammar was on that? Bet not, not better not. Bet not nobody. Double negatives. You ain't supposed to use double negatives if you're going to have proper grammar. Bet not nobody never. Say nothing. <laughs> I'm alliterative with those ends as well. Bet not nobody never say nothing about me. <laughs> Come on, say amen to me. You know, you're going to get out of church, you're going to see your friends. How was church day? It was good. What did the preacher preach about? He said, bet not nobody never say nothing about me. <laughs> Title of the message, bet not nobody never say nothing. And I said, no, N-U-T-T-I-N. <laughs> his brother Reuben disrespects his father. What did he do? He slept with his father's concubine. But his father's concubine his, was his mother's handmaid, who was his other brother's mother. When did this mess start? Like, what did it do? Like, one day they walked by, and they made eye contact. Y'all know how that stuff start. Just one look. I mean, what made him sleep with his brother's mama? I mean, Joseph was old. Jacob was old, I mean. <laughs> he did have, you know, like three or four he was trying to maintain at one time. You can't maintain one if you want to know the truth. Say amen to me. Solomon had a thousand, 600 wives, 400 concubines. No wonder he went crazy. <laughs> Come on, say amen to me. He stripped of his coat, which symbolizes birthright. 
He told them they dream, he had a dream that they were going to be bowing down to him. They took him, stripped him. We ain't bowing down to nothing. Bow down to this. Took him, threw him in the from the moment they saw him coming from a distance. And did you hear what he, did he tell you about this dream? I tell you what, when he get up here, we gonna see what's gonna happen to this dream. They were already jealous of him. He makes it worse. They all came to hate him. The anger was so great, the only thought they had towards him was to hurt him and to kill him, cause him pain and suffering to put a stop to his progress and put it into his dreams. He didn't have a perfect childhood. In Genesis 37, 2, it says he was 17 years old when his brothers accosted him. Then it goes on to say in Genesis 41, 46, that he was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, which means that he had 13 years of intense pain, 13 years of suffering, 13 years of physical and mental and emotional duress which would equip him to sit on a throne and enjoy a position of headship in the plan and purpose of God. That 13 year trial prepared him for his greatest triumph. Those 13 years of pain prepared him for his purpose. Look at somebody and say whatever you're going to now no matter how bad it might seem you when you come out you will be properly prepared to walk in your purpose. You you might feel despised and rejected. You might be the victim of undeserved malice. It might seem as if the devil has the advantage right now, but I'm going to tell you like the old saints used to say, God is not finished with you yet, and he didn't bring you this far. He you, come on, say amen to me, in the situation that you're in. God knew what he was doing with Joseph, and God knows what he's doing with you. He still has his hands on you. Look at somebody and say, he's still leading, still guiding, still directing, still move, molding, still shaping. And even though it might appear to be hopeless right now, if God has given you a dream, God is going to make sure that that dream is going to manifest in your life. Touch that person next to you and help me preach. Say the devil can try all he wants to, but he can't stop me. Say the judges can try, the critics can try, the gossips can try, the fake news reporters can try, the enemies can try, but they won't be able to stop my dream, won't be able to kill my vision because the same God that was with Joseph is the same God that is with me. And just like he brought him out, he's going to bring me out to shout. Notice something. The Bible says, and I got about 10 more minutes, God has a way of preserving you even though the time of your change hasn't come yet. The Bible says in Genesis 39 that whatever Joseph did, God made it to prosper. What do you mean whatever he did? When he was in slavery, God made him the head slave. When he was in prison, God made him the head prisoner. Come on, say amen to me. After this trial was over and the time of his change had come, God had a position of headship waiting for him. God has a position of headship waiting on you this morning when he brings you out of the situation that you are in. You'll be the head and not the tail, above always and not beneath, coming behind and no good thing. No matter what he went through, Joseph continued to trust in the Lord. He depended on the Lord. And God used those 13 years of bad times to prepare him for the good times. <laughs> Come on, say amen to me. He used those 13 years of bad time to prepare him that would begin in the 14th year, the good times would begin. And God told me to tell somebody, your preparation time is almost over. Your trial is just about over. You know why? You passed all your tests. And now it's time for the promotion. Not only is God going to bring you out, God is going to reverse your fortune, turn your situation around, but he's got a blessing waiting for you at the conclusion of this matter. And it's going to begin very, very soon. Shout about it. Look at somebody next to you and tell them, say, after all you've been through, you deserve to be blessed anyway. Tell somebody I'm talking about me too. Oh, yeah, after all I've been through, I deserve to be blessed. God said your appointed time is just about here. Do you realize God used the famine to facilitate Joseph's breakthrough and promotion? It says he called a famine upon the whole land. How many of you know God would use hard times to take you up higher? 
He'll use a famine to cause you to prosper. He'll use a recession to get you a blessing. He'll bring his plans to life, for your life to pass in spite of everything that you've been through. Same in the me. The devil tried to stop the plan. Joseph's brothers tried to stop the plan. The slave traders tried to stop the plan. Potiphar's wife tried to stop the plan. The jailers tried to stop the plan. But when God's got a plan for your life, it don't matter what obstacles or what hindrances or what fake friends. Come on, help me come your way. If God has called you and God has chosen you and God has predestined you for a purpose, it doesn't matter what you're going through at this present time. Somebody say amen. If God has his hand on you, it doesn't matter what you've been through, what you're going through, what you've done, or what you're yet to go through when the time of your change comes he's going to deliver you with a strong and mighty hand and you'll realize he'll cause you to realize that none of the weapons that were formed against you were able to prosper the hurt was a weapon, the betrayal was a weapon, the lie was a weapon, the divorce was a weapon, the drugs were a weapon, the alcohol was a weapon, the marriage struggles were a weapon, come on, say, the loneliness was a weapon, the depression was a weapon, come on, talk back to me, there were weapons, and the forming of those weapons resulted in a time of bondage and a time of captivity, but come on, say amen to me, but the fact that you're still praising God right now, the fact that you're not hurting anyone, anymore. The fact that you're not lonely or depressed or suicidal anymore. The fact that you're happy. The fact that you're sane. The fact that you're celibate. The fact that you're sober. The fact that you're still in church is the evidence that even though the weapon did form, it was not able to prosper. Look at that person next to you and tell them when the time of your change comes. God is going to bring you out with a strong and mighty hand. Look at somebody say, don't touch that dial. This is only a test. Help me, Holy Ghost. He's going to bring you out in a better place, in a better way, feeling better about yourself, with a better mindset. Better, 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 better. God is going to bring you into something better than you've had in a long, long time. God brought Joseph out and put him over the same ones who placed him into captivity in the first place. Who God, God, watch this. God put him over. The Bible says in the Psalms 119, it talks about Joseph. It said his feet, they hurt with feathers, which means they had the chains on his ankles. And you know, when they would chain you up, they wouldn't chain you comfortably. They would stretch you as far as they could and make you as uncomfortable as possible. That was the place of, of his anguish and pain. But God put him over the place of his struggle. God put him in control of the people that bound him up. Come on, say amen to me. And gave him two sons when he came out. You know why? He, the Bible says he blessed Job with a double blessing when he came out. He said in Isaiah that for your shame you shall have double. God will always bless you twice as much. Come on, say a minute. Because you had it twice as hard. He put him over all the people that put him into bondage. Put him over the jailers, <laughs> put him over the slave masters, <laughs> put him over his brothers, <laughs> put him over that woman that lied on him. <laughs> Come on, talk back to me. He gave him two sons whose names were prophetic in nature. Manasseh, which means God has made me to forget all the pain and all the stuff I had to go through. Made me forget the pain of what I had to go through. And a second child, he named Ephraim, which means fruitful. It means he said, God prospered me, increased me in a place of my affliction, in a place of my pain, amen? And he caused me to forget all of the hurt and pain of my father's house. He mentioned his father's house one last time. He looked back one last time. He reminisced one last time. And then he told himself, I'm forgetting those things which are behind. 
I'm going to forget all the things that wounded me. I'm going to forget about the hurt and forget the pain, forget the people, forget the family members that hurt me. I'm going to look forward from now on to everything God has in store for me up ahead. Said God, caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Prospered me. He blessed me. Bless me in front of the jailers. <laughs> Bless me in front of the slave master. Bless me in front of the ones that I prophesied to and the ones that I encouraged that forgot about me when they were all right, when they got a breakthrough. He blessed me in front. Look at somebody and say, when God brings you out of your struggle, he's going to bless you with a double blessing. First, he's going to cause you to forget your pain. Then he's going to release abundance on you. He's going to heal you emotionally. He's going to repair you internally. He's going to correct all your externals. And then he's going to bless you materially. Somebody shout glory. First, he fixed Joseph on the inside. Then he blessed Joseph on the outside. Look at somebody and say, God is going to fix you on the inside. You know when you know when you're fixed? When it don't hurt no more. When you can look at him and don't feel a thing. When you can think about him and don't feel a thing. When you can keep on keeping on in your life and it doesn't bother you anymore. When you don't care what they do, you don't care who they with, you don't care where they go, you don't care where they at, you don't want to hear about them, you don't want to know about it. All you know is God is blessing me right now. Shout about it. The Bible says after that, all his brethren had to come and bow down. You know what it was? God made them have to recognize. Look at somebody say, God is going to cause all the ones, the fake friends and the family and enemies and antagonists that try to stifle your vision and steal your dream and come against you. He's going to cause them to have to recognize. They're going to have to acknowledge your success, acknowledge your deliverance, acknowledge your breakthrough, recognize your anointing, and see the fulfillment of your dream. And Joseph recognized in hindsight, I'm about done, when he looked back over his life, he looked at his brothers, you know, you know what? You know how you plot and you plan and you tell yourself that one of these days I'm going to get them suckers. You know what I'm saying? And when they all, when finally they were standing before him, he looked at them and was like, you know what? It ain't even worth it. It ain't even worth it. Look at these clowns. Look at these bums. These are the, the jokers that had me crying. These are the ones that had me upset. I was twisted because of them. I was trying to impress them. That's my fault for sharing my dream with some losers in the first place. What did I expect them to do? How did I expect them to act? He said, you know what? You know what he told him? He said, I ain't even mad at you. Because now I realize it wasn't you that put me in this bondage. It wasn't you that did this. It was God all the time. Look at somebody and say, I've had it rough in my life. But now I realize it was God all the time. Joseph, you know what God was saying? I need to get you away from them people anyway. I don't care if they are your brothers. I don't care if it is your family. I don't care how long you've been on. I had to get you away from them anyway. And the only way I could get you away from them was if they turned on you. Because you're so loyal and you're so loving and you're so forgiving and you're so compassionate. You to stay with them in spite of their mistreatment. Come on, say amen to me. Look at somebody and say, stay faithful to God. He didn't moan. We don't read about him griping and complaining and moaning about God. It says, until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. And God brought him out big time. Touch somebody and say, you're about to be brought out big time. He told me you've been hated long enough. <laughs> you've been in bondage long enough. Broke, busted, and disgusted long enough. You went from one bondage to another. 
You went from the pit to slavery, from the slavery to the prison, from the prison to the dungeon, from mental captivity and relational captivity. And God said, uh, even though you've been bound up, you notice something, and I'm done for real. I'm going to try to be done. Even though Joseph was in prison, his anointing was still kicking in. He down in prison prophesied. He's down in prison hearing from God. He's down in prison relief. You know what? You tell yourself, man, I'm all messed up. But I'm still anointed. You're still anointed. You're still a worshiper. You're still a praiser. You're still faithful. Money messed up, but you're anointed. Relationship issues, but you're anointed. Can't keep a car, but you're anointed. Keep having to move out of your house, but you're anointed. But God is about to bring you out set you up and bless you big time somebody shout big time come on stand up on your feet god told me to tell somebody in here you're not a failure and you never were he said i'm preparing you for success he's called you chosen you anointed and appointed you and you're not on your way down you're on your way up and just because one door closes that's fine. That means it was time for it to close. Because, but God opens doors that no man can close. And sometimes it's, no, it's not denial, it's direction. It's time for that door to close. Because God wants you to engage in some new ventures. He wants you to expand your thinking. Look at somebody next to you and say before I stop, say, I'm being prepared for my purpose. What I went through, it wasn't separation. It was preparation. Because as long as I was linked up or connected to this person or that person, or I was in this relationship or that relationship, I could never be who God wanted me to be. I could never do what God wanted me to do. Come on, say amen to me. Wasn't separation. Wasn't separation. That breakup, it wasn't separation. More glory from more glory from your life and to use it as a challenge. There was a better way, and things progressed and progressed. But at that time, I never could imagine that I would pass to a church. Him over all the people that put him into bondage. Put him over the jailers. <laughs> put him over the slave masters. <laughs> put him over his brothers. <laughs> put him over that woman that lied on him. <laughs> Come on, talk back to me. He gave him two sons whose names were prophetic in nature. Manasseh, which means God has made me to forget all the pain and all the stuff I had to go through, made me forget the pain of what I had to go through. And a second child, he named Ephraim, which means fruitful. It means he said, God prospered me, increased me in a place of my affliction, in a place of my pain. Amen. And he caused me to forget all of the hurt and pain of my father's house. He mentioned his father's house one last time. He looked back one last time. He reminisced one last time. And then he told himself, I'm forgetting those things which are behind. I'm going to forget all the things that wounded me. I'm going to forget about the hurt and forget the pain, forget the people, forget the family members that hurt me. I'm going to look forward from now on to everything God has in store for me up ahead. Said God, cause me to be fruitful. In the land of my affliction, prospered me. He blessed me. Blessed me in front of the jailers. <laughs> blessed me in front of the slave master. Blessed me in front of the ones that I prophesied to and the ones that I encouraged that forgot about me when they were all right, when they got a breakthrough. He blessed me in front. Look at somebody and say, when God brings you out of your struggle, he's going to bless you with a double blessing. First, he's going to cause you to forget your pain. Then he's going to release abundance on you. He's going to heal you emotionally. He's going to repair you internally. He's going to correct all your externals. And then he's going to bless you materially. Somebody shout glory. First, he fixed Joseph on the inside. Then he blessed Joseph on the outside. Look at somebody and say, God is going to fix you on the inside. You know when you know when you're fixed? When it don't hurt no more. When you can look at him and don't feel a thing. 
when you can think about them and don't feel a thing. When you can keep on keeping on in your life and it doesn't bother you anymore. When you don't care what they do, you don't care who they with, you don't care where they go, you don't care where they at, you don't want to hear about them, you don't want to know about it. All you know is God is blessing me right now. Shout about it. The Bible says after that, all his brethren had to come and bow down. You know what it was? God made them have to recognize. Look at somebody say, God is going to cause all the ones, the fake friends and the family and the enemies and antagonists that try to stifle your vision and steal your dream and come against you. He's going to cause them to have to recognize. They're going to have to acknowledge your success, acknowledge your deliverance, acknowledge your breakthrough, recognize your anointing, and see the fulfillment of your dream. And Joseph recognized the hindsight, and I'm about done. When he looked back over his life, he looked at his brothers, you know, you know what? You know how you plot and you plan and you tell yourself that one of these days I'm going to get them suckers? You know what I'm saying? And when they all, when finally they were standing before him, he looked at them and was like, you know what? It ain't worth it. It ain't even worth it. Look at these clowns. Look at these bums. These are the jokers that had me crying. These are the ones that had me upset. I was twisted because of them. I was trying to impress them. That's my fault for sharing my dream with some losers in the first place. What did I expect them to do? How did I expect them to act? He said, you know what? You know what he told him? He said, I ain't even mad at you. Because now I realize it wasn't you that put me in this bondage. It wasn't you that did this. It was God all the time. Look at somebody and say, I've had it rough in my life. But now I realize it was God all the time. Joseph, you know what God was saying? I need to get you away from them people anyway. I don't care if they are your brothers. I don't care if it is your family. I don't care how long you've been on. I had to get you away from them anyway. And the only way I could get you away from them was if they turned on you. Because you're so loyal and you're so loving and you're so forgiving and you're so compassionate, you to stay with them in spite of their mistreatment. Come on, say amen to me. Look at somebody and say, stay faithful to God. He didn't moan. We don't read about him griping and complaining and moaning about God. It says, until the time that his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. And God brought him out big time. Touch somebody and say, you're about to be brought out big time. He told me, you've been hated long enough. <laughs> you've been in bondage long enough. Broke, busted, and disgusted long enough. You went from one bondage to another. You went from the pit to slavery, from the slavery to the prison, from the prison to the dungeon, from mental captivity and relational captivity. And God said, uh, even though you've been bound up, you notice something, and I'm done for real. I'm going to try to be done. Even though Joseph was in prison, his anointing was still kicking in. He down in prison prophesied. He's down in prison hearing from God. He's down in prison relief. You know what? You tell yourself, man, I'm all messed up. But I'm still anointed. You're still anointed. You're still a worshiper. You're still a praiser. You're still faithful. Money messed up, but you're anointed. Relationship issues, but you're anointed. Can't keep a car, but you're anointed. Keep having to move out of your house, but you're anointed. But God is about to bring you out, to set you up, and bless you big time. Somebody shout big time. Come on, stand up on your feet. God told me to tell somebody in here, you're not a failure, and you never were. He said, I'm preparing you for success. He's called you, chosen you, anointed and appointed you, and you're not on your way down. You're on your way up. And just because one door closes, that's fine. That means it was time for it to close. Because, but God opens doors that no man can close. And sometimes it's, it's not denial, it's direction. 
it's time for that door to close because God wants you to engage in some new ventures. He wants you to expand your thinking. Look at somebody next to you and say before I stop, say, I'm being prepared for my purpose. What I went through, it wasn't separation. It was preparation. Because as long as I was linked up or connected to this person or that person, or I was in this relationship or that relationship, I could never be who God wanted me to be. I could never do what God wanted me to do. Come on, say amen to me. Wasn't separation. Wasn't separation. That breakup, it wasn't situa separation. That divorce, it was preparation. Preparation. Your problems are really the preparation for your purpose. But you know what else? You're not going to be preparing forever. <laughs> your preparation season is over. Look at somebody and say, it's over. It's not going to last forever. You're going to come out big time, going up higher than you've ever been before. Lift your hands. Father, in the tremendous, magnificent, spectacular, outstanding, amazing, marvelous name of Jesus, whose we are, whom we serve, whom we live, move, and have our being in, we thank you once again, even for allowing us to assemble together one with another to partake of your holy word in your holy sanctuary on this morning. Now, Lord, I pray special blessings, increased blessings, double blessings upon everyone in attendance on this morning. I pray that you bring them out of their individual adverse circumstances and situations with a strong and mighty hand. Amen. Reverse their fortune, oh Lord. Deliver them from captivity and bondage. Amen. And bless them with the fulfillment of their dream, with the manifestation of their vision, with the reaching of their goals. Bless them, O oh Lord, with the desires of their heart as a result of the delight that they have in you. And we're careful to give you the glory, honor, and praise in advance for everything we're expecting you to do. I pray that you heal broken hearts, that you soothe hurt feelings, that whatever the pain and the wounds that they've experienced, oh Lord, I pray that you cause their suffering to be alleviated, that you minister grace to them, pour in oil and wine, cause them, oh Lord, to have a, a greater level of esteem for themselves, increase, increase their feelings that they have about themselves, let them know they're fearfully and wonderfully made, marvelous works and wonders, created in your image and after your likeness. And that there's nothing that they cannot receive if they just believe. And we thank you in advance for every answered prayer, every removed burden, every destroyed yoke. We thank you for it and give you praise in Jesus' name. Shout amen. Shout hallelujah. Shout glory. Now clap your hands one more time. Open up your mouth and give God well, saints, that just about wraps it up for this evening. I pray that you are blessed in, by, and through that word, um, and that the eyes of your understanding were opened, and that you were enlightened as to your position in the plan and the purpose of the Lord. I want to encourage you to hold on to your faith, amen, and hold on to the word of God. Until, amen, your change, the change that you are ultimately believing God for will come or the change that God ultimately has in store for you will come. You know, oftentimes what God has in store for us is not what we had in store for us. Oftentimes what God ultimately, amen, brings us to is not a place that we even dreamed about going, amen. Joseph never thought that he was going to wind up as the prime minister of Egypt. When you think about it, he went to bed the night before, amen, the same way he had went to bed numerous other nights. He woke up that morning and did whatever his morning ritual was until someone arrived at his jail cell and notified him of the fact that Pharaoh was summoning him and the rest of his life and the rest of his future, the rest of, amen, the future of the nation of Israel was changed. Amen. Um, he wasn't expecting it. God oftentimes blesses you and God oftentimes, amen, places you into your position of purpose 
unexpectedly. I mean, he, like I said, he, he, went, he went to bed that night. The first night, he went to sleep a slave. <laughs> he went to sleep the next night a prime minister. Wow. That's how quick your change can come. That means God doesn't need a whole lot of time to do what he's going to do when he's going to do it. Now, he will maneuver your life. He will maneuver, amen, incidents and events of your life so that when you get to the place of his divine timing, when the fullness of your time comes, amen, God will place you into that position. That's why you can't get weary in well-doing and you can't um, give up on God. You can't get slack. You just have to stay focused. And when it seems as if you're doing nothing, believe me, God is doing something. When you're going about your ordinary, God is going about his extraordinary. When you're doing the natural, God is doing the supernatural. And when the time comes for it to be made manifest to you, believe me, he's going to reveal it in a, a, a very big way. Let me tell you something. I can remember, and it doesn't seem like that long ago, when I was new convert Scott, when I was brother Scott, I just gave my life to the Lord and um, everything was new. And I wanted to focus on consistent church attendance and quote unquote, staying saved. I always loved to read. So I began to read the Bible to the best of my ability. And then whatever I was a part of, I always endeavored to put my all into it. I really didn't get involved in too many things that I had casual feelings for. So, you know, we, we began going to church and we started out doing some things because we were there. I, I wasn't content to just come in, sit down, get up and go home. You know, initially that's all I was able to do, but I found myself volunteering for different things. And I wound up driving the church bus for a while. And then my wife was working in the kids' Sunday school for a while. And then we were um, uh, doing the TV ministry that we actually originated for the church that we were at at that time when Cleveland first got cable television and they had cable access available. And we found out that you can get a show on there. And we asked our pastor, do you want cable access? And we took that responsibility upon ourselves to be the cameraman, the producer, the director, with everything. We handled the, oversaw the TV ministry for him. And then in endeavoring to do more, we, I remember we were working one time on, on a, a site and we had to do some work at a juvenile home. And we asked the lady there that was the Director, do you have anybody that brings the word of God to these kids? Would you be, would you mind if we did it? And we weren't ministers or anything at that time. We were just believers that saw these kids that were locked up in the juvenile home. And she said, no, if y'all want to, you can. And we would go on Sundays after church. Every Sunday after church at four o'clock, we would go to the juvenile home. And the uh, good kids, these four or five, six or seven, eight or nine of them there for different reasons, emotional problems. Uh, psychological problems, different reasons they found themselves in the juvenile home. And we would go down there and we would share the gospel with them and tell them there was a better way. And things progressed and progressed. But at that time, I never could imagine that I would pass to a church. You know, I was always, as the apostle Paul called himself the least of the apostles, I felt myself the least of the brethren. Because, you know, when I got to the church that I was at, man, them brothers knew the Bible. And they didn't mind letting us know that they knew the Bible too. And they would quote those scriptures and they would just, you know, tell us biblical things. And I just, you know, I had no problem receiving from them in some areas. Some of the stuff they were saying, I was like, hey, man, I don't care. I don't, I don't know about that. But, you know, we had a, just a, a heart to do the things of God. And my wife and, and, and myself and some of the people, some of the, like Elder Florine and different ones that are elders at our church now, our sister Chris, we were just little baby Christians that wanted to serve God. And we had a little home Bible study that we would, we would have on Friday nights, not trying to be a parachurch or take anything away from the church. In fact, the Bible study actually strengthened our Christian commitment. It was just on Friday night. This is what we gave to God because we remember the Friday nights we used to give to the devil. But once again, I never imagined, amen, being a pastor. And when I got to the next church I went to, the brothers there were already in position, already in place. And I was never one to try to jockey for position or, or try to do this and that. I'm just there doing what we're doing. Said that to say this, we wind up pastoring, I believe, and I say this very humbly, one of the greatest churches in the history of Northeast Ohio. I believe the New Spirit Revival Center has served as an inspiration for a number of other churches that came along after us. I believe there are a number of women in ministry now 
There are a number of female co-pastors in Cleveland, Ohio now that are a direct result of Dr. Belinda ministering side by side with me. And to be quite honest, her ministering with me was an outgrowth of when we went to our prior church and the pastor had no problem with his wife being in ministry. That was a first for us to see something like that. And he had no problem with his wife. Bishop Bill McKinney had no problem with Bishop Shirley McKinney being his wife and his co-pastor, no matter what the, the, the people that were against women pastors or had to say about it, he didn't care. And that inspired us. And as a result, you know, others were inspired. So I said that to say this, you never know what God has in store for you. You just walk in the steps that you believe he has ordered for you. You trust the Holy Ghost to notify you when to put the brakes on. <laughs> you trust the Holy Ghost to, to, to steer you in different directions and let it go from there. Amen? Amen. Listen, taking too much time, let's bless the Lord. I almost forgot this part. In a different way, through the giving of our material gifts, let's pay our tithe. Give the Lord our very best offering on tonight. Let's go to givelify.com, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y.com, or text to give, tithely, PayPal, whatever platform you want to utilize. Amen. To sow seed into New Spirit Revival Center. I want you to go there right now and do your very, very best. The Bible says, until the time that his word come, came, speaking about Joseph, the word of the Lord tried him. That word tried means to test him, to challenge him, to prove him. He was faithful to the word of the Lord that he had during his time of trial. And that's all the Lord instructs us to do, to be faithful in the word that we receive during our time of trial. He had the word of God as it was passed down from Abraham to Isaac, from Isaac to Jacob, and from Jacob to him. And so that was the word that he walked in, the promises of God, the, the testimony of God. We have 66 books, 1,189 chapters to rely on. We have God's word to keep us, to test us, to try us, to prove us. And we prove ourselves through the word. So I want you to prove yourself on tonight. Be faithful, amen, to his word. His word on tithing is an area that we are challenged in. Do we obey God or do we let our flesh tell us to disobey God? Tithing is never a matter of can or can't. Tithing, giving offerings, it's always a matter of will or won't. If I have a dollar, I can give him a dime. If all I got is $10, I can give him a dollar. If all I got is $100, I can give him $10. And what we used to say, <laughs> when I was young in the Lord, these were the things that we were brought up on. If what you have is not enough to meet the need, then make it a seed. If it can't meet the need, you make it a seed because there's a harvest attached to every seed you sow. All right? So I want you to go to givelify.com. Do your very best. Sow your very, very best seed on tonight. Amen. And believe God for increase. And I'm going to be believing God right along with you. I want those of you that will to sow an over and above $33 seed. Amen. Three being the number of resurrection, restoration, and recovery. We're going to sow that over and above $33 seed on tonight. Those that have a heart to do so, I pray that you, amen, uh, respond to that heart, that spirit, and do it. All right. We'll be in church this Sunday, 3130 Mayfield Road, Cleveland Heights, Ohio. 10.15 a.m. Praise and worship begins. I want to see your face in the place. Get, get to church this week. You hear me? You get yourself to church. If you don't have a church home or if you desire to visit on this week and you're going to change churches or you sense God leading it upon your heart, some of you might be watching right now and you haven't been to church in a long time and you're feeling convicted. You sense God leading you. Well, I believe God is leading you through my words right now. Come to New Spirit Revival Center this week. 10, 15 a.m. the service starts, and I believe and I guarantee you won't be disappointed. Amen? All right, if you can't be there, but you still want to participate in the service, we'll be right here online at 11 o'clock sharp. All right? All right. Well, so much as in me is. Phew, I pray that you were blessed. Praise that you sold your seed, and I'm looking forward to seeing you on this week. In the meantime, I want to pronounce the blessings of the Lord to be upon you. I bless you in the name of the Lord.